asked you this before. How many of us truly want revival in this house? In our lives, in our families? And it takes a hunger. And it takes a heart that says, God, I want more than, than what I'm experiencing right now. Father, I, I just want more and, and I need more. And so we're going to go into the last part of that today. But I want to just encourage you and emphasize, how many of you have heard Philip Baker speak? He is just truly amazing speaker. And he's got the privilege and the honor of, of him being our friend, close friend. And he loves C3. And we, we're in contact a lot. And he just, he always asks, I need to know what's going on at C3 because he loves you. He loves you. And we get Laura this time on the day before. And I just, ladies, whatever it is, it's a couple of weeks. How, how difficult is it to set aside a couple of hours to come and just have God just bless us for our faithfulness, first of all. For, and like Pastor Jason said, a free meal. <laughs> that, would, that would pull me in if I was a lady, for sure. Free meal. If it's a guy deal, activities, free meal, hot dogs, steak on a stick. You understand that, right? I'm going to be there. So I encourage you. We'll have a sign-up sheet next week to give us an idea on how many uh, people are coming so Give us and, and so we can order the food. But I encourage you to say, hey, I'm taking time out of my Saturday. Busy schedules, I understand that, to be fed, to be fed, to be fed. Okay? Okay. All right. You know, I told you the story. Laura got me these glasses. She bought, <laughs> she bought five pair because <laughs> I just lose them, break them, whatever. And I'd get to church, and, and where's, where's, we miss Tommy so much. We do. Uh, we just miss him so much. He was just such a huge role here, and I and I know that he is just encouraging us in heaven right now. And we we love you. We do. He's a good brother, right-hand man. So anyway, um, you know the story. Uh, just about every Sunday, I would say, oh, man, I forgot my glasses. Well, Laura made sure that I would never need glasses for the rest of my life. <laughs> these, these don't, they look like girls' glasses. I'm gonna... <laughs> this is a more manly look, am I right? <laughs> Well, let's just find out. I'm gonna... I can't see out of those. So here it is. Yes, this is more like it. Somebody didn't lose their prescription glasses, did they? <laughs> wow. Okay, back on track. Um, <laughs> revival. And why does, why does revival come? What is, what is this? It's a spark that ignites nations. Uh, revival, first of all, God doesn't need, need anything to start a revival. He doesn't need fancy preachers, big church buildings, small church buildings, people that meet every Thursday or Saturday, fasting and praying, which the Bible is very plain. that It, it goes with all of that, but, and we'll, we'll get to that. So don't take this out of context. Revival starts just because God loves people. He just, he just loves people. I'm going to pour out my spirit. I'm going to bless them. I'm going to anoint them. I'm going to heal them. I'm going to empower them. God just loves people. That's the loving God that he is. So that's number one. Number two, God loves me, loves you individually. He loves people. But how many of us can say, I just don't really feel like God loves me? Let me tell you something. If you were the only one, the only one, the only human being, Jesus would have died on the cross for you. He would have given his life up just for you. So don't let the devil, don't allow him to just lie to you. I'm not valuable to the kingdom of God. You are valuable, so valuable, and nobody else carries your gifting to God. Okay? That's number two. Number three, we love God. 
Can people see that we love God through our actions? If somebody was to say, hey, I heard that they're a Christian, but wow. Have you ever known anybody like that? <laughs> or a representation? I used to be a hellion, for sure. Raised in the church. My dad was a pastor, and I ran. I used to pull into the parking lot. My kids think I'm just nuts. With my windows rolled down on my 64 Bel Air four-door Chevrolet with Black Sabbath, Blue Oyster Cold, Deep Purple, all of the groups, and my Craig PowerPlay stereo to the max with all the windows down on my car. Why? Because I didn't want to be a preacher's kid. Last thing in the world I wanted to be. I saw the weight that my dad carried in a good way, but still I, I saw the weight. And you know what? Sometimes, this not this church, this is the best church I've ever been in my entire life, and I'm 60, almost 63 years old. You are wonderful. You're wonderful. Church people can be mean. They, they, <laughs> I know. Okay, so we love God. Do we love God? Or do we act like we love God? No, we, we love God. So God loves people. God loves me. We love God. So what's left? Probably the most difficult out of all of them. God needs us to love people. <laughs> Save the best for last, right? Love people. You don't understand. They don't take showers. They're, they're grimy. They cuss. They play rock music driving into the parking lot at church. I still had people loving me. And loved me back into the kingdom. Loved me back into the kingdom. And if nobody had reached out, I'm not saying that mom and dad didn't, didn't weren't the best parents ever. No, I'm not saying that. Sometimes we need somebody else to say, you're valuable. You're valuable. So what does that entail? And you spoke on it this morning a little bit, Pastor. Um, Love your neighbor. We're going to get into that. <laughs> Reach out to your neighbor. Love them unconditionally. And how many of us can honestly say that there's certain people in our lives right now that I don't necessarily love? Well, you're a pastor. You're supposed to love everybody. I do, except... <laughs> I'm throwing bait out to you, if you haven't noticed that. <laughs> there are at least two people, and you would understand too if you knew the circumstances. I love them. The last thing I want is for them to die and go to hell, and that's where they're headed unless things change. But what they've done, well, we won't get, we won't get into it. So I, do I battle with that? I think I've got a whipped and something will pop up, and then it's like, God, you know, help me because I'm just a man and you're just a man, just a woman. And you go through the same things, people that have done things to your family, done on your job, coworkers, and we'll, we'll get into all of that here in just a minute. But we have to understand that Jesus was very, very specific and very plain. The second commandment that I'm giving you, we're going to read it, but just as important as the first is to love people. To love people. So are you, are you ready for this? Or do you want me to dismiss and go home? We need this. Do we want revival? The first three we can deal with. Oh my goodness, God loves people unconditionally. That's Hallelujah! God loves me. Yay! In spite of myself, God loves me. We love God. Oh, well, of course we do. We wouldn't be here. Love people. So let's move on. True revival, 
it requires people, not just us. It's going to be all of us, but it requires people and not just a small amount of people. If a revival in a church and fire and the Holy Spirit drops in like we've never experienced before. Lives change, addictions fall, people raised from the dead, healing, leprosy, all of the things that biblically the, the Word has given us. It requires people that are hungry, right? So is, is, is that us? Is that us? I believe that it is. Biblical revival, listen to this, turning sinners to Christ for salvation to help them find a renewed usefulness and acceptance, returning once again to life. Isn't that wonderful? Let me read it again. Revival, biblical revival, turning sinners to Christ for salvation. To help them find a renewed usefulness and acceptance returning, once again returning to life. That's our job. It's to expose them to a God who loves them. It's our job. It's not, well, Jason, he'll take care of it. You take care of it. Look, I'm tired. I'm going to the property or really Biden. I'm going to the lake. I'm going to be gone for two, three weeks. Can you handle that while I'm gone? Because I don't really like people. I do. I do. But you know what I mean. I don't want to have to deal with it. Easter last week, you know, Lindy, sermon, great sermon. So, sometimes people just overload. I just don't want to mess with them. So, wow. How about let's reach out. Let's encourage people to reach out, next door neighbors, people at the grocery stores. I love grocery stores because you catch people, at the worst of the worst in their day. How's your day going? You could see it all over them. <laughs> Sometimes you get an earful and you just sit and smile. And then it opens the door. Do you have a home church? What's your church background? It's an unoffensive question to everybody. God just loves people, and He loves us. So what's our role as Christians? Let me ask you something. <laughs> are, we, uh, are we all commanded to share the gospel to non-believers? Every one of us in, the, in this house, is every one of us required, or is it just up to the elders of the church? Be honest. Who? Everyone, so let me, it, it, yes, it's overwhelming. Well, everybody, so how many of us do that? I'm, gonna, I'm stepping on toes. I'm going to make your toes sore this morning, and mine also. We don't know when Jesus is coming back. What if it's this afternoon? We got up late today. Aggravated, had to stop in at the grocery store and pick up something. Aggravated, the counter, person behind the counter just really needed some help. She didn't have, I don't have time for that. God deal with them because I've got to get to church and my wife and I aren't getting along all that great this morning. Kids are being, being little hellions. And, and have you ever been there? So who didn't we minister to? in our busy life. If we're not going to share the gospel, then who's going to? The devil and his demons? No. True revival requires people. That's us. Let's read Romans chapter 10. So I hope I'm... (laughs) I'm off to a good start, stepping on your toes. Does everybody feel uncomfortable right now? (laughs) Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 15. We'll start with verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's a gimme, right? 14. But how then, this is wonderful, how then, or how can they call on Him to save them unless... 
they believe him. And how can they believe him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells him? Verse 15, And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the Scriptures say how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring the good news. Just from that, that only to encourage us to just leave the house today, the sanctuary today, and minister to people on the way home the rest of the day and maybe all through next week till we read it again. Everybody deserves to be ministered to in spite of what we think. Ouch. But you don't know what they did to me. That's the most difficult part of getting past this humanity and this carnal nature is there has to be some kind of a penalty. Let God dictate the penalty. Let God dictate the penalty. Don't let it entrap you into unforgiveness because it's a pit and it's a deep pit. Okay? I'm going to let you process that a minute. Are we? <laughs> it's, all, it's an honest question. Um, are we messengers to the saved, this, the ones that have accepted Jesus as Lord in, in, into their life and into their hearts? Are we messengers from this last scripture we read? Are we messengers to the lost? If it's to the lost, then every spare moment of every day should be dedicated and earmarked for the lost. Am I correct? Paul's very plain. How are they going to hear? How are they going to know? How are they going to... All of these, all these how-tos, well, it's because of us. So every spare minute of every day, not to take us away from our earthly good, because I believe firmly in divine appointments, but if we have a divine appointment open up in front of us, it's our responsibility to minister the gospel of Christ to the lost. Them. Them. Is this a salvation message? Yes, it is. God loves people. God loves us. We love God and we love people. I'd like to read. I'm just going to walk down through these scriptures quickly because this wasn't intended to be a big, long sermon today. We'll just find out how. And I'm not closing, just for those of you who want to throw stones. I'm not going to ever. Where's Kent? Is he here today? <laughs> oh, and, and I, I, I guess it's genetic, and I got it from Dad because he would say, now in closing, and like 35 minutes later, still hasn't closed. I don't want to be that guy. So in, in closing... We're not closing. All right, I'm going to read these scriptures. We're going to walk down through it, so just be ready with you off the screen or your iPhone. The first one is Matthew chapter 19, verse 19. Honor your father and mother. Very specific. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so some people might say, well, I don't like myself. But really we do because we do like ourselves. We don't like what we see in the mirror sometimes. I don't like what I don't see in the mirror sometimes. But you know what? I can come up with a wash rag, and some of you can't say that. Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40. 37, Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God. Listen, this is, this is important. You must You must. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all, all of your mind. He covers all of the bases. You must be absolutely sold completely out to Jesus. Verse 30, this is the first and by far the, the, the greatest commandment. I put by far in there, but you understand what I mean. Verse 39, a second is equally important. What possibly could it be that's more important than that? Love your neighbor as yourself. We lose the context. 
It's easy to love God with everything that's in me to serve Him. We feel Him every day. We, we minister to Him our praises and our offering of worship. And we tithe because we don't have to. God, you don't need the money. I, I tithe because I want to bless the kingdom. It's a principle. It's easy to praise Him and adore Him and worship Him. But, but what just as important, God, is to minister to and love them? This is so very important. Just hypothetically, what if the person that was set up in front of us, the one that we, we don't like, the one that we some, hate even is a horrible word, but unforgiveness is, is just right up front. What if this person that we, we have unforgiveness in our heart for and we, we, have, we don't have any plans of forgiving them, what if God stationed and ordained from the beginning of time that we witness to that person we can't stand and we have unforgiveness for to minister the kingdom of heaven to them so that they have an opportunity to go to heaven? What if the one shot that you had And you missed it. Think about it. How important. And it gets to be, well, you know, I'm just not that kind of person. God will send somebody along that personalities jive. And we all got the same likes and customs and hobbies and likes to hunt, likes to fish. You know, he's going to send somebody along that we can actually get along with. Uh, rather than somebody I can't stand uh, to minister the gospel to. How easy is that? That's wonderful. Thank you, God, for favor, right? Well, God, you <laughs> you know, God, I have real issues with this person. Unforgiveness, God. Heal, Father, the wounds in my heart first. Heal the wounds because my desire is that they be saved and go to heaven in spite of me. In spite of me. Open the door, God. I want the door closed. Open it before me. If I'm the only one, God, that will ever minister to that person, God, let it be me. Let it be me. Matthew 5, 46. It says, if you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. What good is it to minister to somebody that doesn't need ministering to? I believe everybody needs to pick me up, but when it comes to the kingdom, Jesus was very plain. You've got a group of friends, but I told you to go to the nations. I told you to go to the nations. Go. Don't take anything with it. Go. Just go and preach the gospel. You don't have to like them. You don't have to live with them. You don't have to cater to them. What I need you to do is get away from your bad self and the person that you think you should be in God's eyes, and actually the person that you are, and then take that anointing to the nations and go. Just go and be quiet. That's how important it is. But God, you don't understand. Trust me. He gets it. Trust me. 
He gets it. Matthew 18. Matthew 18, 21 and 22. Verse 21, when Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often, I love this. <laughs> how often, he, he, he got blindsided. He, I got to finish the verse, but he had no idea what was coming. How often, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? First of all, who sins against him? You've got to be kidding me. Sins against me. How about sins against God? Peter's arrogance in this was just astounding. How, <laughs> how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Good lands. That's way out of count. I forgive you. 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 And we're done, right? We're good? Jesus' answer is perfect. No, not seven times. You know, Peter's probably thinking, one or two. One or two ought to do it. Jesus replied, 70 times 7. For those of you that, that don't know, that's 490. That's just the beginning. What a perfect example. Try forgiving somebody 490 times, and then Jesus says, that's just the beginning. So... What Jesus was really trying to say is unforgiveness has no place in a Christian vessel. But you don't understand what they did. He knows just exactly what they did. And so does the devil. To think that the devil doesn't feed off our expressions when we're hurt, when we're bitten by other people, friends, family, co-workers, bosses. If we're bit, our expression behind the scenes, the enemy looks at He can't read our mind, but he knows exactly where our mind is when we do this. Oh! How many times was that? It's ridiculous, isn't it? Nobody should have to forgive somebody 400 times. <laughs> really? Then how about this? Forgiveness has no place in my life. Father, I forgive them. I know that they've done me wrong, God, but I wouldn't be where I'm at today if it wasn't for that lesson. I wouldn't be where I am today, God, if I didn't suffer through this. Thank you, God, for that opportunity. And forgive me <laughs> of my downfall. All of us want to be forgiven by God. Every house today wants to be forgiven by God. So, the text that love your neighbor is yourself, our forgiving and loving our neighbor. opens the door to leading them to Christ. No hands. How many of us today want unforgiveness just to go away in our life? Jesus knew that unforgiveness was going to be so prevalent in us 
when he said, just as important as loving me with everything that you are, every, your mind, soul, spirit, your entire being wrapped up in absolute love for him and all. That the second one, but just important as the first one, is love your neighbor. Do you think he didn't know how difficult it was going to be? I shared with you, some of you haven't heard this, but it involved my dad. I've got one more scripture to read. We'll get out here by noon, I promise you. When he was 13, his mom gave him away, him and his three sisters, because she couldn't afford him. She was getting married again. Her dad, His dad died. She couldn't afford him. She said, you're going to have to get out, go do something. 13 years old. She would be in jail today if she did that. Kicked all, all four of them out. He had to quit school at 13 years old in the eighth grade, get a job to pay room and board at a boarding house where he stayed by himself at 13. He did that for four years. When he was 17, for early access into the, into the service, he went and his mom signed him in, and he went in and did four years of service in the Army. When he came back out, he came back to get to his mom's to get his, he had a 22, little 22 guns, shoes, clothes, all of his belongings, and then she had thrown them all away. There was no um, evidence that there was ever a Robert or Rabel anywhere. She, she just X'd him off of her life. So he was drunk in a bar. This is, this is a real story. Drunk in a bar, and he was crying about everything that he had gone through as a, as a family. And the Holy Spirit just dropped into the bar in the middle of drunk and sobered him up instantly and convicted him. I need you way more than you need yourself. Okay, well, God doesn't need him, but he needed his calling to accomplish those things that he had ministered to. God wanted him into the kingdom. So that night, sobered up, went, the only thing that he could find in town that was even open was a, a Nazarene tent revival that was going late. He went straight to the altar and got saved, and he never looked back. What he didn't know is the unforgiveness that he had for his mom was neatly covered up with friends, with church family, with all of the things that go along with like C3. You're an unbelievable group of people. I love you. My wife and I love you so much, and we talk about you always. But he covered that unforgiveness up and just put layers of humanity over and over and over it until, well, it's gone, right? Because I don't feel it anymore. It's gone. It wasn't. It was a festering sore inside of him. The Holy Spirit began to deal with him. Years into the ministry, you still have unforgiveness in your heart. I need you to allow me to heal you. And he began to pull back the layers. And he went to see his mom. And I met my grandma for the first time when I was five years old. She opened the door. She did cuss me out at five years old. She hadn't changed any. But he forgave her. He forgave her. 